Okay, so today we are going to talk about meningitis. We'll discuss that what is meningitis. We'll discuss what is the presentation of meningitis. We'll discuss what are the causes of meningitis. What is Kernig's sign? What is Brudzinski sign? And how do you check them? We'll discuss the latest treatment protocols of meningitis. And we'll discuss the profile access of the patients who come in contact with the patients of meningitis. First of all, what is meningitis? Meningitis is an infection or inflammation of the meninges. What are meninges? Meninges are the layers that surround the brain and protect the brain. These layers include dura matter, arachnoid matter, pia matter, and they surround the brain. Any infection or inflammation of these layers is called as meningitis. What is the presentation of meningitis? Meningitis patients present with fever, headache, and stiff neck. Fever, headache, and stiffness, this is the classical presentation of patients with meningitis. And with fever, headache, and stiff neck, 69% of the patients would be having change in their mental status. When you check the Glasgow Coma Scale, their Glasgow Coma Scale would be less than 14. This is one of the very important findings in meningitis. So now there are four things, fever, headache, stiff neck, and change in mental status. In patients of meningitis, 95% of the patients will be having at least two of these four findings. So other than these presentation, patient will also be having photosensitivity, sometimes sensitivity to the light. And 5% of these patients will also present to you with seizures. Coming to the signs of meningitis, we have three classical signs, nuchal rigidity, Kernig sign and Brudzinski sign. Nuchal rigidity is a very common sign seen in the patients with meningitis. How do you check nuchal rigidity? You check nuchal rigidity by lying down the patient straight in supine position. Then what you do is then you, that you slowly and gradually flex the patient's neck. You flex the patient's neck in an effort so that their chin touches their sternum. Their chin touches their sternum. You flex the neck. And in a patient with meningitis, their neck will be so stiff. Their neck will be so rigid that you won't be even able to go halfway. So that is a presentation of nuchal rigidity. Their neck will be so stiff that you won't be able to touch the chin of that patient with their sternum. That is nuchal rigidity. Coming to the Kernig sign, what you do in Kernig sign is that you flex the patient's hip joint, you flex the patient's thigh at a 90 degree angle and then you flex their leg at a 90 degree angle. The leg is flexed, the hip joint is flexed. Now comes the real part. What you try to do to elicit Kernig sign is that you slowly and gradually straighten their leg. You slowly and gradually straighten their leg. And whenever you try to straighten their leg, these patients will experience severe pain in their spine. Or in some patients, what you would see is that when you are trying to straighten their leg, they will flex their other knee joint. So these are the two findings that show a positive Kernig sign. When they experience severe pain in the back, when you try to straighten the leg or when they flex their other knee joint, that is a positive Kernig sign. Basically, the concept behind it is that the patients are having inflamed meninges. And when you try to stretch those meninges by straightening the leg, these patients will experience severe pain down their spine. Or in an effort to relieve that pain, what they will do is that they will flex their other uh, knee joint because flexing the knee joint relieves the meninges. Even in some patients, what you would see is that patients of meningitis would be lying in their beds with their knee flexed. They would be lying with their knee flexed because flexing the knees relieves the meningeal irritation. So that is a Kernig sign. What is Brudzinski sign? In Brudzinski sign, what you do is that you lay down the patient straight with their legs straight legs are straight and then you slowly and gradually flex the patient's neck. When you slowly and gradually flex the patient's neck, what happens is that the meninges of the spinal cord get stretched because the neck is stiff and you are trying to stretch those meninges. When you try to stretch those meninges, what will happen is that patient will experience severe pain and patient will suddenly flex his knee joints. 
when he will flex his knee joint he will do that in an effort to relieve his pain because i as i said flexing the knee joints relieves the pain of the meningeal irritation so flexing the neck will result in flexion of the knee joints that is a brudzinski sign other than these findings in patients with meningitis you might be able to see fundoscopic findings in fundoscopic findings you might be able to see papillary edema absent venous pulsation what is papillary edema what is absent venous pulsation if you see this is a normal retina a normal retina with a normal circular beautiful optic disc and if you see in this picture this is a picture of papillary edema in a patient with meningitis and if you see there is blurring of the uh, margins of optic disc the circular optic disc is no more there there is a blurring which shows that the patient is having papillary edema coming to the absent venous pulsation now if you clearly look at this optic disc this circular part you would be able to appreciate that something is pulsating within it that is a venous pulsation in a patient with in a patient with papillary edema or meningitis this venous pulsation will be absent you won't be able to see venous pulsation in a patient with papillary edema and it is it is a very important finding of papillary edema other than that you might be able to find focal neurological deficits in this patient because the bacteria has now reached the brain you might be able to find hemiparesis aphasia cranial nerve palsy visual field cuts and you might examine the sinuses of the patient that patient might give you a history of sinusitis what is the relationship of sinusitis with meningitis basically these sinuses are drained by the veins that go into brain and whenever there is infection of the sinuses these veins will carry the infected blood bacteria to the brain which results in meningitis in skin findings you might be able to appreciate in some patients petechial rash petechial rash is specific for neisseria meningitis if a patient is having petechial rash consider neisseria as a cause of meningitis coming to the causes of meningitis in the causes of meningitis just memorize this one very very high yield bug this strep pneumo is the most common cause of uh, meningitis in all ages above neonatal period and there is an important point that i want to mention here something called as austrian syndrome or osler's triad sometime it happens that the patient has meningitis with pneumonia with endocarditis and all three caused by strep pneumo that is called as austrian syndrome osler's triad neisseria meningitis is a common cause of meningitis in adolescents in the teens teens who are living together in hostels in military camps and the neisseria meningitis causes meningitis and you would be able to appreciate petechiae and purpura it is an encapsulated bacteria therefore it causes infection in those uh, patients who are having complement deficiencies those patients who are having splenectomy because encapsulated bacteria are, are removed by complement and spleen and if these two are deficient these patients are a high risk patient for neisseria meningitis infection listeria affects immunocompromised patient listeria is transmitted through contaminated dairy products and raw vegetables just remember immunocompromised dairy products a listeria is a bug that can in cause meningitis in these patients other than that staph aureus if the patient had a neurosurgical procedure a stent placed month ago two months ago and now he got meningitis it's the staph aureus just because the staph aureus is commonly found in our hands in uh, on the surfaces and when you have opened up the brain when you have put something from outside definitely you have transmitted staph aureus in that patient and that meningitis is due to staph aureus h influenza cryptococcus cryptococcus is an important cause of meningitis in hiv positive patients who have cd4 count less than 100 viruses can also cause meningitis that is called as aseptic meningitis now whenever a patient presents to you with fever headache stiff neck and you are suspecting that this patient is a case of meningitis the next and the most important thing that you would have to go for is to decide that you have to go for lumbar puncture or not some patients are safe for lumbar puncture some patients are unsafe for lumbar puncture what are the patients that are unsafe for lumbar puncture if you fail to do lumbar puncture in these patients remember the fails mnemonic 
feel F for focal neurological deficit, altered mental status, immunocompromised patient, lesion at the site where you're poking the needle, seizures. If the patient is having any one of these, in these patients, you cannot go for lumbar puncture. These patients can be having a space occupying lesion, a mass in their brain. And if you do lumbar puncture, there is a risk that you would cause brain herniation. Because in a patient with a brain occupying lesion or space occupying lesion in the brain, if you do lumbar puncture, there is a risk that that patient will develop brain herniation and death from that brain herniation. So what you do is that you give antibiotics and you send the patient for CT scan to rule out the mass in the brain. Why are you giving antibiotics? We are giving antibiotics because we have to save the patient's life. If you're suspecting meningitis and you cannot do LP, you cannot do lumbar puncture and you are delaying the lumbar puncture, you, are del you cannot delay the treatment. You have to start the treatment straight away. You give antibiotics to save the patient's life, to save the patient from the permanent neurological damage that that patient can have. So you give antibiotics and you send the patient for CT scan because we cannot wait for a lumbar puncture to give antibiotics. We have to give antibiotics beforehand. Giving antibiotics before lumbar puncture can ruin our cultures. But since there is a delay in the treatment of patient because we cannot do LP straight away, we have to wait for CT scan, we have to send the patient to the radiology department. So this is a time consuming process. We give antibiotics beforehand. In patients who are safe for lumbar puncture, what you would do is that you would go for lumbar puncture and you would send the cell count and the cultures. Cell count would be back earlier, cultures would take long time. So the cell counts would be back and in the cell count what you would see is that whether it is polymorphonuclear cell predominant, neutrophil predominant or it is lymphocyte predominant. If it is polymorphonuclear cell predominant or neutrophil predominant, it is most likely bacterial meningitis. And if it is lymphocyte predominant, then there are three possibilities. Either it is TB or it is fungal or it is viral. If it is TB, then you would, you would do is that you would order culture for TB and PCR for TB on the fluid. And you start the patient on RIPE for 12 months. For pulmonary TB, it's six months. But for the TB meningitis, it is for 12 months. And you also have to give steroids with it. For fungal meningitis, most likely it is cryptococcus and crypto, we have to do cryptococcal antigen and these would be most likely immunocompromised HIV patient and you would put the patient on m -foteracin. If it is viral meningitis, most likely the causes are either Rocky Mountain spotty fever or Lyme's disease. Rocky Mountain spotty fever would have a centripetal rash proceeding toward the center of the body and Lyme disease most likely has facial palsy associated with it. Both are treated by giving ceftriaxone. Coming to TB, TB meningitis is a very important cause of meningitis in the regions where tuberculosis is prevalent. Region like ours, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, in these countries, TB is prevalent. And mostly these patients who are put on treatment of bacterial or viral meningitis and they do not respond to the treatment. And then you have to suspect that this patient might be having TB meningitis and you have to shift it to the TB therapy. Coming to the treatment of meningitis. Treatment of meningitis, we divide the patient into three categories. One are the patients who are not immunocompromised, who are not having any comabs and they just got meningitis. We treat them by giving ceftriaxone 2 gram IBPT. Ceftriaxone is third generation cephalosporin with vancomycin 15 to 20 milligram per kg IVBD. And if the patient's age is greater than 50 or the patient is alcoholic, most likely these patients are immunocompromised. In such immunocompromised patient, listeria is an important cause of meningitis. You would cover listeria as well with ampicillin 2 gram IV 4 RV. And if the patient is having beta lactam allergy, beta lactam allergy patient will be allergic to ampicillin, which is a penicillin, and ceftriaxone which is a cephalosporin because both of them are beta-lactam antibiotics. If the patient is having beta-lactam allergy, it substitutes ciprofloxacin or estrionam in place of ceftriaxone. Remove ceftriaxone and give any one of these. And if the patient is having allergy to ampicillin, you can give trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole instead of ampicillin. If the patient is immunocompromised, in immunocompromised patient, you definitely have to give ampicillin because 
you have to cover Listeria monocytogenes in this patient. With that, you have to give vancomycin and ceftazidine. Ceftazidine is third generation fellows per in two gram IV eight hourly. And coming to the last case, if the patient has recent neurosurgery, as I said, if the patient had a head trauma, or if the patient had any stent placed, that patient might be having step aureus as a cause of meningitis. In that patient, you have to give vancomycin with ceftazidine that would kill step aureus. Corticosteroids are a very, very important component of meningitis treatment. I cannot stress this point anymore. They decrease neurodisability. They protect the brain because when immune system is fighting with the bacteria, what immune system does is that sometimes it cannot differentiate that whether I am hitting the bacteria or I am hitting the brain cells. Sometimes it damages the eighth cranial nerve, vestibulocochlear nerve is a most common nerve that is damaged in patients with meningitis and patient would be having a lifetime hearing loss. To protect them, to protect them neurologically, you have to give dexamethasone, 10 mg IV, 6 hourly for 4 days or even longer. They reduce neurodisability and mortality by fixed 50%. And you must start them with first dose of antibiotics, even 15 to 20 minutes before that. Do not give steroids in cryptococcal meningitis because these cryptococcal meningitis patients are usually the patients who are HIV positive, already immunocompromised, and steroids can even induce cryptococcal meningitis in such patients. Coming to the prophylaxis of meningitis, in the people who come in contact with the patients of meningitis have a risk that they might get meningitis. So, in a people who come in contact with this patient, the close contacts can be given rifampine 600 mg BD orally for two days, or you have the option to give ciprofloxacin 500 mg per orally, or you can give cefriaxone 250 mg IM. Precaution is that there is droplet transmission, so all the measures that protect person from droplet transmission can be taken. In summary, we talked about what is meningitis, what are the symptoms of meningitis, we talked about the, the organisms that cause meningitis, we talked about the signs and symptoms of meningitis, we talked about the approach to meningitis in which you can do LP and in patients you cannot do LP, we talked about the treatment of meningitis in immunocompromised normal individual and neurosurgical patients, we talked about the prophylaxis. If it is your second or third video that you have watched from this channel and you still haven't clicked the subscribe button, please go down and click the subscribe button and hit the like button so that you do not miss any new video from the channel. Thank you very much.